Let's pray. Oh God, we just sang it to you. Our confession of hope and faith, made like him, like him we rise, alleluia. Ours the cross, the grave, the skies, alleluia. Lock that hope, lock that faith deep in our hearts as you speak to us now through your word, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. The message that echoes from the empty sepulcher today catches us by surprise. Ain't no grave going to hold my body down. <laughs> Johnny Cash, the great American country singer, who, by the way, and you didn't know this, who got delivered from his deadly addiction to cigarette smoking by attending one of the Seventh-day Adventist Church's stop smoking clinics. They used to call it a five-day plan to stop smoking. You might remember that. Or and then it became breathe free. And for the rest of his life, he carried in his heart a soft spot for Adventists. Johnny Cash, just days before he died, collaborated with a producer friend of his named Rick Rubin, and they recorded the title song on the album that was released posthumously, Ain't No Grave Gonna Hold My Body Down. One reviewer wrote, wrote it this way, when the recording was released on the posthumous album, album America, America 6, Ain't No Grave, came out in 2010, Listeners encountered a fragility in his legendary voice that made the performance porous and transcendent. The Washington Post critic Bill Frisketts Warren wrote about it with these words, spiritual, even biblical quality of the music, end quote. The roots of this song are tied back to Negro spirituals in the late 1800s. Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. When I hear the trumpet sound, I'm gonna get up out of the ground. Cause ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. The Easter story, let me remind you, once upon a time, after the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back that stone and sat on it. His clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. Oh, I like the, the graphic way Desire of Ages renders this. He who had vanquished death and the grave came forth from the tomb with the tread of a conqueror. Amid the reeling of the earth, the flashing of lightning and the roaring of thunder. Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. Ain't no grave gonna hold my body down. When I hear the trumpet sound, I'm gonna get up out of the ground. Cause ain't no grave can I, gonna hold my body down. I'm so excited about this song, I wanna start singing it. Can I get an amen to that song, by the way? Come on, ain't no grave. Ain't no grave. That was a shout, by the way, that ignited the book of Acts. Mm hmm. When the truth penetrated society, there is a risen Savior. That was the shout. But what's so amazing to me, and I just saw it this week, and I got to share it with you, is a profound cause and effect that the message of the risen Savior produced in the lives of those who believed in the beginning. Story number one, Peter is preaching his heart out. It's the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus rises from the tomb. He's preaching away. Let's interrupt him in a sermon. Here we go. Acts chapter 2, verse 32. God, Peter's preaching, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of it. Yes, sir. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. 3,000 people come forward in that altar call and are baptized that day. And look what happens to that fledgling movement just birthed. Here we go. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give anyone who had need. Now, you you don't see it yet, but it's there. Just enough evidence to hint at the conclusion. But because you're not convinced, let's go to the second story. 
Story number two, Peter and John have spent the night in jail. How come? Because they healed a lame man, born lame, by the way, healed him in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, who is alive and well. Yep. They've been arrested. They're in front of the authorities. We're now in Acts chapter 4, verse 10. And Peter, we interrupt Peter again. Here he goes. Then know this, you clergy, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. That room full of clergy is stumped. They've got to dis- debate next steps. They dismiss Peter and John. Verse 18, and then they called them in, Peter and John again. And they commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. And after further threats, they let the two of them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. Peter and John go back to, the, to the, uh, the fledgling movement, and they now bring the healed lame man with them, a new member. They have a mighty prayer session, and at the end of the prayer session, true story, the Holy Spirit is poured out all over again. Let's pick it up. Notice the effect. And after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the Word of God boldly. Keep reading. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them all that there were no, whoa, no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need." End quote. This is the second time now we've observed this pattern. You say, what pattern, Dwight? Well, see if you see it. Whenever the message of a risen Savior is proclaimed, there is a reciprocal response among those who believe. Story number one, they embrace the message of the risen Savior and they immediately begin to serve one another, especially the needy among them. Story number two, they embrace the message of the risen Savior and they immediately begin to serve one another to the place there is not one needy person in the whole movement. Leading us to tentatively, okay, I'm willing to put the word in, tentatively conclude. The message of a risen Savior ignites a mission of radical service in the one who believes. Hmm. Hmm. They believe in the risen Christ, and they demonstrate that belief by radical service or radical serving one to another. So radical, in fact, that some are willing to liquidate their assets for the sake of the needy. Have mercy. Why? Well, I'm going to add a word here. Because the message of a risen Savior always... Now, this is, this is dependent on the premise here, belief... The message of a risen Savior always ignites a mission of radical service in the one who believes. Story number three, you say, well, Dwight, I'm not sure. Give me one more. Okay, story number three, just a few pages later. Let's go to uh, Acts chapter 9. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. That's Aramaic. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. And both the Greek and the Aramaic mean gazelle. She was always doing good and helping the poor. Now, there must have been something about this little baby girl that's born that leads this mother to conclude that, you know what? We got a spry little dancer on our hands here, and we're going to name her Gazelle. Well, I got three granddaughters that you just met, and they are spry all over the place. They're like gazelles themselves. So Dorcas, Tabitha, whichever name you wish, when she embraces the teaching, the announcement of a risen Savior out of devotion to him, she immediately devotes her life to radical service, immediately. And then tragedy strikes, and she does die very unexpectedly, but I want you to keep reading. About that time, she became sick. And died. And her body was washed, Jewish custom, her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Keep reading. Lida was near Joppa. 
So when the disciples heard that Peter was over there in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, please come at once. You got to do something. Peter went with them. And when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. And what, is, what sight greets his eyes? All the widows stood around him crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. She's made a mark on that little community. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees. Oh, I wish I had a YouTube of this. He got down on his knees and he prayed. And turning toward the dead woman, the corpse, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up. Now, I learned from my friend F.F. F. Bruce, the great New Testament commentator, something I'd never seen before, and I, I want to pass it on to you. What, Peter, what is happening here, and you'll get it immediately, what is happening here is that Peter is repeating what he saw done when Jesus raised Jairus. Remember the, the, the ruler of the synagogue, Jairus, a little 12-year-old daughter, she died, and Jesus raised the daughter. Peter is step by step. Watch this. First of all, he watched Jesus do this. Only Peter, James, and John were there. He watched Jesus say, everybody out of the room, just everybody out. What does Peter do? Everybody out of the room. Then he hears Jesus in Aramaic, because that's what Jesus spoke. And by the way, the Gospel of Mark is the only place that gives us Jesus Aramaic words in that room with the dead body of the 12-year-old. The, 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 the Aramaic is Talitha Kumi. He hears Jesus say Talitha Kumi. And what Peter does is repeat those identical two words, except he changes one letter. Instead of saying Talitha Kumi, he says Tabitha Kumi. He's following Jesus right down the line. And what happens next? Oh, let's go back. Let's set it up. Peter, Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Keep reading. Turning toward the dead woman, he said, Tabitha Kumi, get up, gazelle. She opened her eyes and seeing Peter, she sat up and he took her by the hand. Guess what Peter saw Jesus do with the daughter of Jair Jairus? What, what did he do? Jesus took that little girl by the hand. And Peter says, I guess that that's what we do next. Step three. And he takes the hand and he brings her right up. He took her by the hand and he helped her to her feet. And then he called for the believers, come on in, take a look at this, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. And this became known all over Joppa and many people believed in the Lord. Can you imagine that headline? Wow. Wow. The power of a risen Savior flows back into that dead body and beautiful Dorcas of Tabitha, or Tabitha, she wakes up and what she was doing when she was cut down, she immediately resumes when she's raised back up. She starts serving the needy. I'm telling you, I'm not making this up. Three stories in a row. Story number one, story number two, story number three, all with the same truth. The message of a risen Savior always ignites a mission of radical service in the one who believes. That's the key. You've got to believe, of course. In other words, if you today, I'm talking to you right now, if you today believe he is alive, and most of, most of you here do, ipso facto, that's, that's two little Latin words. On the basis of that fact, if you believe he's alive, you serve. That's it. If you believe Jesus lives right now, you serve. You serve. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Stop. <laughs> I like that. I like the way that begins. I serve. I serve. If you believe he's alive, you serve. Wow. But what, what I've been brooding over this week is how does this work in real time? How does this work in real life? Come on. Here's, what, here's the conclusion I've come to. Now, you're going to have to check this out because I have no way to, to, to do but listen to what you say. I'm going to give you three givens, okay? Three givens. And let's see if they help us. Given number one. Put it on the screen for you. Given number one, Jesus conquered death. Our greatest enemy, hands down, hands down, our greatest enemy, right? That's, a, that's just a given. I mean, come, please. I traverse up and down the halls of hospitals in this county. I traverse up and down the roads of this county. I sit beside those 
on the edge, at the edge of life, on the verge of death, and you got to trust me, there is nobody that considers death good news. Oh, yes, the, the, the little caveat that you want to insert here, that's true. For some, death does come as a sweet release from the grueling battle to live, but otherwise, death is our mortal foe. Never make peace with death. What's that, Dylan Thomas? Rage, rage into the night. Don't go softly. Fight it. Death is an enemy. But thank God for the New Testament, 1 Corinthians 15. But thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Ain't nobody that you have, ain't nobody that I have, can be pinned down in that grave. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Wow. Give it number one. Come on. Let's just admit it. Jesus conquered death. Amen. Let's go to give it number two. Give it number two. There is therefore, so following this little syllogism perhaps, there is therefore no other enemy that can successfully oppose him. Now, this is really important because it's not just death that's, that, that's our enemy. And, and, if, and if Jesus licked death as he did with his own mighty death and resurrection, there's nothing. Now, here's the point. There is nothing. There is no one else that we need to fear. Do you understand that? In, in, in Romans chapter 8, what's that great line? If God is for us, who can be what? Who can be against it? Nobody. That's the, that's the, it's a rhetorical question. Nobody's against us. Not the enemy of fear. Mm -mm. Nor the enemy of despair. Not the enemy of hopelessness, nor the enemy of helplessness. Whatever paralyzes you in the darkest of nights, whatever immobilizes you in the brightest of days, I don't care what it is, it cannot overcome you. It can't. If you're in Him, you got it. No matter what. Three givens. And then I'll sit down. Okay, here comes number three. Given number three, and so, based on given one, given two, and so, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Oh, I love that line. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. There it is, the can-do spirit of the risen Christ that permeated, infiltrated the early Christian church and turned them into can-do heroes for the king. Can do. I can do all things through Christ. They believed they could do it with him and through him. They saw the world as their parish. They saw their assets as their gifts and the needs all around them, their glorious opportunities. Man, this is perfect. Let's go to work. Sign me up. Robert Schuller, in his wonderful little book, Move Ahead with Possibility Thinking, I believe he's right. I'll put Schuller on the screen here. You can talk yourself into almost any attitude. That is one of the great psychological truths of the human race. We had psychologists in first service. We've got psychologists sitting here, and they'll tell you this is absolutely true. You can talk yourself into almost any attitude. Most of us have too often talked ourselves into fatigue, talked ourselves into failure, talked ourselves into defeat. Man, I got a young friend that calls me every now and then. He said, oh, brother, you're not going to believe this. This is just, this is just you got to, you, you should be working where I'm working. Oh, yeah? Yeah. I'm worn out. Not getting anywhere. Dead end. No, no, no. Don't talk, don't, don't talk yourself into almost anything. No, no, no. Not that. Shooter goes on. Repeat out loud, I'm tired. Repeat out loud, I'm finished. I'm through. And guess what? You'll soon believe it. Your mind will believe what your lips say. Be careful what your lips speak to your mind. Be very careful. The positive application, I like this, so this is the flip side. It not only works negatively, it works beautifully, positively. The positive application is equally, equally powerful. I'm going to be happy today. I'm going to be courageous today. I'm going to be confident today. I'm going to be energetic today. I'm going to be kind today. I'm going to be loving today. And you say it. I'm going to be loving all the way through that day. And you know what? You will be loving. The power of the risen Christ, you will be. Yes, you will. The positive application is equally 
powerful. I'm going to be happy today, though the skies are cloudy and gray. No matter what comes my way, I'm going to be happy today. As the French author Colette viewed her life on the screen, Schuler writing, someone said to her, yo, girl, it looked like you were a very happy child. And she answered, yes, it's too bad. I didn't realize it at the time. Most of us have no idea that what we're going through right now is actually good news. We're so convinced that it's bad news. It's just ruining my life. We have no idea that God says, come on, girl, boy, hold off. You can't see what I see. Wow. So what's that mean? As as Shooter put it, you you, you can talk yourself into almost any attitude you want to. But I love the attitude. I love the attitude of of the Bible. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's that can-do spirit that has led men, women, and children through the ages into radical service to their risen Savior. It's that can-do spirit in the name of Christ, my risen Lord, that last Sunday, over 100 people, you saw it on the big screen, over 100 people. It was fatiguing. You bet, four hours standing the whole blooming time. But when, the, when, when Sunday was over, these over 100 went home with a sense of gratitude, a sense of being energized because 41 little children that were sleeping on the floor in this county now are sleeping on beautiful beds with pillows and, and, and quilts and mattresses. What's wrong with that? All because they volunteered. They say, yeah, I, I, I can help. Sign me up. I'll do it. I'll do that. Wow. He said, Dwight, listen, I just haven't been able to find a real need. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you brought that up because I I, want to remind you that we have a volunteer engagement committee right now that is working. And they're going to be working until July 1. And they have to fill, get this, 600 positions of men, women, teenagers, young adults, college students, non-college students, 600 volunteer positions by July 1. And it, there, I, I, I need you to know, there are a handful of volunteer opportunities, don't tell anybody, but have your, that, that have your name written all over them. No, I'm serious. Don't tell them I said that. They're ready to go. No, no, I can't. I'm not gifted. Oh, boy, there we go again. I'm not gifted. You keep saying I'm not gifted all day long, and guess what? You're not gifted. I'm not smart. Oh, boy, that is the biggest lie in the world. You're bright. Can do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Yeah, but I can't get up in front and preach. I just, I, I don't want anything that has me getting up in front and talking. Now, America's number one fear is public speaking. Now, I'm not going to do it. No, if that involves that, you just count me out. I want to tell you something. You can do it. I'm going to pick on my son sitting on the front row right now. When he was in college here, uh, Glenn Russell, you, everybody knows and loves Pastor Glenn Russell. And Dr. Glenn Russell, he took a bunch of academy and uh, college kids over to Zimbabwe. I think that's what it was. Yeah. And Kirk was going to preach for the first time in his life. <sighs> I was not in town. I was at a camp meeting when, when he called and talked to Karen. His first words, Karen says, hey, how'd it go? He said, uh, boy, it went, but it wasn't pretty. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? This boy can get up in front of anybody today. Talk to anybody. He wants to. Why? Because he did it anyway. If you let your fears proscribe you, they stop you. You can't live by your fears. You have to live by faith. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You can get up. That job may say, hey, girl, you're going to stand in front of a group of kids. That's okay. I'll stand in front of them. You eventually stand in front of a group of adults and you'll be fine. No, no, you get the point. No, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Mm. So don't you think the risen Christ has the authority to give you the ability to, to say the very yes that the church is needing from you? Just say yes. Sign me up. Of course he has it. To, for you to be the very servant of Jesus the church needs like Dorcas and Peter and John and the healed lay man? Of course. Oh, I serve a risen Savior. But I love the way it begins with serve. I serve. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I 
know that he is living. Whatever man may say. Now listen, listen, listen. I see his hand of mercy. You see that? I see his hand of mercy. There's no Jesus' hand will never show up. You're the hand. It's your hand of mercy that Jesus uses. I see his hand of mercy. I hear his what? Voice of cheer. If Jesus is going to be speaking into the job that you take on, you'll be speaking. He's using your voice. And just the time I need him, he's always, what? what's, what's the word? He's always near. Sing it with me. He lives, he lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives within my heart. Oh, hallelujah. Put it on the screen one more time. Therefore, I can do. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Sign me up, Jesus. Let me find a need and I'll fill it for you, Jesus. I don't care when you need me. I don't care where you need me. I don't care what you need from me. I can do all things through you. Sign me up. And if you're willing to sign up, I need you to contact me right now. I'm going to put a number on the screen. I wish you would text one word to this number and I'll write a letter for you. Let's put it on the screen. This is, uh, if you'll go to, if you'll just type up in the uh, number space, 269-281-2345. This is our standard number here. Everybody in Pioneer knows it. But you don't have to be from Pioneer to do this. Just, and then text the words. That's all you do. Just sign up. Four. Two more parts and it'll be sign up six and the series is over and two Sabbaths. Just text in the word sign up four and there will be a little letter. And I need you to send this letter to the Volunteer Engagement Committee. Ah, it's not that complicated. Here we go. Dear Volunteer Engagement Committee, here's my name. Sign me up. I can do all things to the risen Christ who strengthens me. If you'll send, if you'll just hit send on that, we got the rest of the information we need. We'll be back in touch with you. And there will be, there will be a volunteer opportunity with your name written all over it. And I have no idea what it's going to be, but you're going to love it. Why? Because in the power of the risen Savior, I can do all things. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. Oh, Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being alive. Thank you for that Heimlich maneuver that took care of sin, and blew, the, blew the door off of the tomb. Ain't no grave going to hold my body down. And dear Jesus, ain't no fear going to hold my body down either. Nope. I sign me up. I gladly serve where you send me. Gladly. With rejoicing. We go out into this Easter Sabbath with the hope of our Lord Jesus in your name. Amen. Before you go, let me take an extra moment to share with you an opportunity to get into the Bible in a fresh new way. All across the world, more and more people are hearing the call to examine scriptures for themselves. If you felt drawn to learn more about God's Word, but you don't know where to start, or you're just looking for a more in-depth examination of Bible truths, then I have something right here that I believe you're going to enjoy. I want to send a series of guides to get you started. This one's entitled, Why Does God Allow Suffering? Each guide begins with a story, an introduction of the subject. Then through a series of focus questions, you'll be learning portions of the Bible you may never have known before. And when you're through, you'll be able to share with others some of these inspiring Bible truths. So just call our toll-free number. It's on the screen, 877, the two words, His Will. Friendly operators are standing by to send these study guides to you. Once again, that's 877 His Will. Call that number. And then again, join me next week right here at this same time. New Perceptions.